I think I would like to start when I came to Hanover. Came to Hanover January of 1934 on that low, low salary. And you, if you spent eight or nine dollars a week on groceries, that was excessive. So it was a little tough if you had a family to uh, be able to get what you needed at a reasonable price. Uh, jobs were scarce, money was scarce. We handed down clothes to other people and we inherited other people's clothes and, and uh, remade them and you know refashioned them to fit and so forth. So we got used to, to cooperating really in, uh, in many ways so that we could make ends meet. It was the holiday season, 1935. America's Great Depression had reached all the way into Hanover, New Hampshire. In this isolated college town, a group of a dozen neighbors, mostly college professors and their wives, gathered in the grade school to talk about the possibilities of establishing a consumer cooperative to bring better fresh foods to Hanover at better prices. These were people who shared a common need, people who realized that by working together, they could accomplish more than any one of them could on their own. In January 1936, the group organized itself as the Hanover Consumer Club with only 17 charter members and no real assets other than their faith in this new cooperative venture. It is important to, to not to forget that cooperatives come out of needs, of needs, of people's needs. It's not, it's not so much individual, but a groups needs. That's what, uh, to, if there is a real need, the cooperative in a group, the cooperative is a wonderful instrument to change the need. And this is what also started the co-op in Hanover, although it isn't visible anymore, but actually in Hanover too there was a need for oranges, for better food, for healthier food. And Well, of course, we started with fruit. Uh, oranges and grapefruits, which very uh, fortunately were s stored in Roger Bristol's cellar. And I think we had fresh dairy butter and other milk products. I recall going to Roger Bristol's garage. Now, this may not be accurate, but that was wherever it was the first place. And grapefruit oranges, and prunes. I can't think why in the world prunes. But anyway, out of the prunes that we always had on hand, you made jellied prunes <laughs> with a package of lemon jello. That was common. Or prune whip <laughs> to use up your... <laughs> you were trying to support that loyalty. I, I imagine there's a considerable skepticism on the part of the outsiders as to whether we could make a go of it, uh, whether it would catch on. After all, Hanover was a pretty conservative place. So, but we weren't disheartened, disheartened by that. Conservative, yes. But this first group of cooperators discovered that, along with raising a few eyebrows, they were actually having a great deal of fun. Working together for the good of the co-op, the members found themselves drawn to each other, appreciating each other's company, admiring each other's talents. In short, the sociability of the early co-op was a surprise fringe benefit. And at that time, uh, the co-op was thought of as a communist organization. There's a great deal of resistance toward that. But uh, when I got to know the people, I thought, gee, these are the most wonderful people I've met. These, these are not bad people. They're, they're not bad communists. We always just think of communists <laughs> as, a, you know, the red flag. <laughs> but, I, uh, I believed in it as, as, a, as a movement. And uh, I think so did these other people. And besides, uh, it is not unamusing. It's rather fun to be with a group 
uh, doing things together and it's sort of a community enterprise and you enjoyed doing it. And uh, so uh, a lot of things in life you get, uh, you get credit for being noble. As a matter of fact, you enjoyed doing what you're doing. And, but nice to get credit for it anyway. Well, a, uh, a truck would come back up and back up and we'd uh, unload and uh, two or three of us would be in there and grab the boxes and pull them out and put them up on the shelf and then uh, come the question of pricing them. And that was a, that was a real problem. And Roger Bristol uh, would figure out what was the price, but it was the damnedest thing because you, we didn't have any, oh, this, you just took a crayon and crayon and crayon each one and put it on the, and put it on the shelf. Of course, then we came to Main Street in those basements, two or three basements, under the barber shop. And it was wonderful. Lou's then was, you know, next door, selling coffee for 10 cents a cup. So you met your friends, and then you went in and had a cup of coffee. That was social. But I, I remember that it was sort of dark in, the, <laughs> in that basement store, and we couldn't wait to get above ground somewhere. The Hanover Consumer Club's first home was in Elliott White's garage on Valley Road, and then in Roger Bristol's basement on East Wheelock Street. But soon it outgrew such limited confines and moved downtown to Hanover's Main Street in the basement underneath Gitz's restaurant on the corner of Main and Lebanon Streets. On November 24, 1936, the club reorganized itself as the Hanover Consumer Cooperative Society. Not long after, it had to move again, this time to another basement below where the Dartmouth bookstore is today. The next move was upstairs into daylight finally, to where the co-op would become Hanover's first self-service food store. But now the co-op needed to raise funds for its expansion. It was 1942, the war was on, and what cash members had was already tied up in war bonds. Raising funds for the expanding co-op proved to be a difficult and daunting proposition. There was an option and the option, of course, was to borrow from the bank. But the trouble is that the bank, I think his name was Furley Bugby, the president of the bank. Uh, does that name ring true? Uh, declared publicly that we had a communist cell was coming into this respective community, and by God, he was not going to have anything to do with them, and, to, and so on and so on. So we were stuck. And uh, so we gathered as much money as we could, and the treasurer, his name was Donald DeGrange, and I worked together and found that we could, we could do this thing and move upstairs and the thing would go, but we needed, and I think the figure is right, I think the figure was $1,600 that were shy, and, but I sat there one afternoon uh, sitting with Don DeGrange, and then down the stairs uh, came uh, Professor Gerald from the chemistry department, who I didn't know well, but I knew him, and uh, just out of despair, I said, Professor Gerald, you couldn't possibly let us have $1,600 for the next six months, could you? Stood there, looked at me. Yeah, I think I could. What a relief. So I said, well, let, let's go across the street from the bank. So Professor Gerald and I went across the street to the bank, and he transferred $1,600. I should have asked him for 2000 but he transferred $1,600 from his account to the co-op account and then went back and bought his groceries. Moving upstairs was a great achievement, celebrated by a grand opening and a gala party. The future looked bright, 
But troubled times lay ahead for the co-op. By the end of the 1940s, it found itself in deep financial difficulty. I'm going to tell the story because it was during that period that we'd gone downhill so much that the value of a share was less than five dollars. And by law, you can't buy or sell shares. And it made it tough. The co-op needed the firm hand of the right manager if it were to succeed or even survive. Arthur Jensen encountered just such a manager at a small food co-op in Medford, Massachusetts, and he used all his powers of persuasion to convince Harry Gerstenberger to come to Hanover to manage the co-op food store. The co-op was three times blessed. With Harry came his wife, Sally, who became the co-op's volunteer education secretary and his young nephew, Arthur Gerstenberger, who ultimately would succeed Harry as the general manager in the years to come. And I think it was bringing in Gerstenberger that saved the co-op and Harry Gerstenberger gave his whole life to that organization and then bequeathed a nephew. The perfect uh, person there was Harry Gerstenberger, who, who was sort of strict with all his members. He wouldn't do anything that he thought was foolish, and he stood up to the board quite strongly, and, he, and that was very important, I think, in a cooperative as much advanced as ours is. Uh, you, have to, you have to have a strong manager who can, be, can face his board and do what, follow what the policy that the board says, but speak up and give his own views. And in this, this respect, Harry Gerstenberger was f perfect. And so was his wife, Sally. Maybe I would never have been so involved and so happy in the work uh, uh, for the Hanover Co-op if it hadn't been for Harry and Sally being the ones who were uh, doing, were the executives of this, of this cooperative. We treasured um, Harry Gerstenberger, and uh, I knew that he had worked so hard to make this possible and to give us the kind of wonderfully operated store. He was a real cooperator who loved people, and he loved to be an educator. He was on the he was in the store talking with people a lot of the time, uh, and knew the members very well. Uh, not all of them, because uh, you know, he just, it was impossible to know them all. But he made every effort to get down and to get to know the people. We did come up the weekend before Labor Day, and then I started working for the co-op the day after Labor Day in 1949. So. Well, it was a very, very small staff, and the size of the store at that time was half of what the main building is now that the bookstore is in. Uh, the bookstore is quite large now because of the annex in the back, but at that time, it was just the main building, which was owned by Mr. Campion, and it was divided into two stores. The co-op was on the left, and on the right was Campion's sporting goods store. And at that time, uh, it was a very small store, very limited in selection due to the size. And we had, I think there were four employees, my uncle, myself, and Agnes Gilbody, and Sandy Buchanan, and that was, that was it. Uh, there was very limited selection of meat, just basically bacon and things that were wrapped like that. Produce was on a dry rack. And uh, it was just a small country store, so to speak. The sales then, I think, for the whole year were almost what the, uh, slightly less than, on occasion, what the co-op does here now in one week. There was an uh, outdoor and then there was an indoor, and the, there were two checkouts. We froze death. Um, How come? It was very cold by those doors. <laughs> Obvious question, sorry. <laughs> and there, as I said, there was only two cashiers at the time. Um, the aisles were narrow, very small store. Meat department was in the back of the store. Uh, down in the cellar, they had their stock room, a uh, narrow passageway with the conveyor belt to your left. And down in the cellar, we used to have a lot of good times playing cards. <laughs> well, when I started, I was hired by Harry Gerstenberger. And 
I was a, you know, a regular bag boy, and my God, we walked from one end of the street to the other. We did, honest, on Main Street. Oh, it's true. Yeah, no. We had no parking lot. So, but it was, it was a, a lot of fun working there. And we probably had, uh, you know, like 10 employees. Under Harry Gerstenberger, the co-op got its financial house in order and began to grow and prosper. By 1958, it took over both sides of its Main Street location, doubling its floor space. And in 1962, it boasted sales of $1 million a year and a membership of 2,000 people, but not a single parking space. The board of directors took a deep breath and authorized the purchase of a parcel of land where the co-op stands today, way down here on the corner of South Park and Lebanon Streets, much to the consternation of many members. And I remembered our expansion program, for instance, when we expanded the meet and when we wanted to move uh, from the present location on Main Street to the, lo the current location there, we uh, had some very large meetings uh, and some very serious discussions about, uh, you know, the need for growth and for looking into the future. Well, that recalls some of the statements that were made where people, uh, when they heard that the cooperative was going to move here, said, look, you're too far out of town and you're just not going to do the business down there. People will not drive that far away to buy groceries. And uh, they came from some very authoritative people here in the college. And uh, But they certainly were wrong. And it was the best move, I think, that the, that the co-operative could make. It was either that or uh, stay on Main Street and, and uh, eventually be overrun, I think, by other stores in the area. So. We were amazed. And the other thing is, that when we thought about where we started from and the fact that we all worked. I mean, every person gave a little bit and that together we made such a beautiful store. I think it's one of the most beautiful stores in the area. The co-op succeeded far beyond the wildest dreams of its founding members. Their pride in what they created could be measured in more than financial success. The co-op succeeded both then and now because its members stay involved. Not always in perfect harmony, but always in different ways. Running for the board of directors, helping to run special events, speaking up at annual meetings, or talking about their co-op and making a suggestion in the suggestion box. I, I think that the fact that we could say to our board and to our manager, uh, we feel strongly about this and that, and, and we are confident that that issue, if it's relevant and if it's, if it's meaningful uh, and if it's possible, uh, that at the co-op we can and could bring about a change, or at least, if not, you know, in the wider world, at least uh, as far as we're concerned in our, in our local area. I think that co-op managers have a unique position and, and a, a great position because all of the management and all of the decisions are made within the store by the manager himself, which is entirely different from a, from a chain store, which is operated by, and the shots are called, by headquarters probably two or 300 miles away. So the, the manager of a cooperative can respond much faster and much better to the needs of the, of the community. It's really the, the most perfect form of democracy. And, you, and I have lived in, uh, in, dictator, in a dictatorship and have very acutely suffered from, from the fact that there was no democracy. And maybe that is one of the reasons why uh, finding such a, a, a good form of locally, locally find such a good form of democratic uh, involvement was of great importance with me, at, for me. It took a long time until I, I became a citizen and uh, I did not vote, but I always had this feeling that in, in, in an organization like the co-op, I could make myself felt. You, you are quite right. You stand up and you speak, and if you are uh, persuasive or, and you are, what you say makes sense, something will happen. And it happens because of the others. That is the extraordinary thing. It doesn't happen because you had a, an individual thought in your bed in the morning and then you e executed it, but, but it happens because you persuaded others that it was good and then it came about. That is democracy, and I think 
it is the it is not a perfect way but the safest way to to run our affairs it's absolutely essential to maintain communication uh, the newsletter that we talked about earlier uh, uh, some people feel that as soon as things get tight well let's not publish that it costs money to send. I say don't that's the most important thing you do be sure to publish be sure to get out the news tell people tell the members what's going on communicate communications and education both are essential in establishing the success and character of the co-op because over the years the co-op has become the source of information for food farming and other consumer issues making it much more than just a food store the co-op's role has been to provide reliable and factual information on all these issues so that members can decide on the merits of each case. That way, you vote with your dollars based on your own best judgment. Consumer information can be as simple as this cereal scoreboard, which is a, a biography of 150 different brands of cereal, including listings for their fat, sugar, fiber, and sodium contents, and relates to signs on a shelf showing which ones are the recent winners of the cereal scoreboard contest. I, I think the education department and the education of the consumers, are, it really is a big important part as to what products the people are going to buy. And I, I think that they can make a much more informed decision if they're aware of, of the, the controversies and the results of using certain products. Absolutely, I think this is, is a key part of the cooperatives in general. And I think the stronger the education department is, I think the stronger the cooperative is. And now you may say, since everybody is available in many places, why still have a co-op? A co-op has become nothing but a big supermarket. But that's not quite true, because from changing and from beginning to provide food, it has become uh, also a place of educating. And the standards of the co-op became the standards of all the places in the Upper Valley. And it is uh, still to this day performing an, an extremely important ed uh, uh, educative uh, task. And in this educative task today, you still see the enthusiasm of the early co-op. The Hanover Consumer Co-op, it's many things to many people. The doors of the co-op will always be open as long as the minds of its members and staff are open to change and new ideas. I think somehow or other there's a wonderful sense of what you might call fraternity or friendliness. Uh, the minute you come in the door this, and see all those flowers, <laughs> it makes you happy. It is fun working cooperatively with other people, doing a job. Everybody's cooperated to, to make it the best store in town. It's this wonderful uh, idea that many people together can do something that one person alone cannot do.